the turtles up on the shoreline. That was fun. Taking a nap. Obviously, they come up there to take a nap. That's kind of cool. Yesterday, we were at uh, Lawai. That's where we went. You know where Lawai Beach is at? Went over there. A great place to snorkel. If you like to snorkel, that's the best place. Yeah, it's, it's just a very, there's not much of a beach there, but it's got a great little launch way to get out there and snorkel. Saw just about every, I thought I was swimming in one of those big, beautiful aquariums, you know. There's just all different types of, of fish down there. But then we got into the sea turtles and got to swim with the sea turtles, and that was, that was really a joy. So, well, good morning. I am so thrilled to be able to, to be here again this week with you and Linda is uh, enjoying herself, and you, you guys have all just welcomed us so, so wonderfully, and I just want to say thank you for that. I can't believe we're, we're not even halfway through so far. This will be, this is really kind of the halfway point, but uh, in many ways, we're not even halfway there yet, so it's been good, and hopefully, uh, I've already answered and talked to a number of you. You've had other questions, so you feel free. Reach out. I'm here for you. Uh, I enjoy talking, especially will of God stuff. I mean, if you're struggling with how to know God's will... Uh, I'm an old dog youth minister like Rick, and, uh, you know, we, we really have, and I, I have a, a deep uh, uh, compassion uh, for, for your journey, and I've been there in my life where I had no idea what God was doing in my life. You, you, have, you have that feeling? You have no idea what God is actually doing? You know, you know he's up to something. The two greatest truths theologically that I have ever come to is this, that number one, God loves me like crazy. God loves me like crazy. There is nothing you can do to outwalk the love of God. And secondly, he's always working. You may not see it, but he's always working. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you have created. What a beautiful day it is. We ask now as, as, as we explore American history that you might uh, give us some deeper insights as well, that you might uh, uh, refresh even my mind on certain things that need to be spoken today that this might be your moment, that this might be holy ground set apart just for us to learn. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, I mentioned uh, yesterday that part of my work is uh, as a cultural historian. And uh, by that I meant that really my chunk of American history that I specialized in was 20th century history. I've written an entire book um, on um, generations and technology. It, instead of calling ourselves, gener- you know, like the GI generation or the baby boom generation or Gen Xers or millennials or Gen Z, I basically cast the generations through technology that we experience. You know, your generation has come up pretty much through what I call the I technologies. So I call you the I techs, the I technologies of the iPad and the iPod and the iPhone and the iWatch, all those types of technologies, social media, stream and cloud technology. That's who you are. It's framed a lot of how you view the world and the windows by which you absorb uh, your world. And, uh, it, you know, this, um, this book here is actually I'm going to donate to the Anchor House, all right, for you guys. But if you would like your own personal copy, I did bring a few extra copies with me. Uh, just see me afterwards, and uh, I'll make a good deal with it for you, okay, if you're interested. I can take cash or credit, but uh, it's a better deal if you want to pay cash for it, all right. But see me afterwards if you're interested in it. But I want to give a copy to the Anchor House. In fact, would you like to just take this? I'll just give this one here to you. Yeah, there you go. I saw a bookshelf down there, and that's good. The other thing I want to do is, uh, you know, we're not, we're not going to have time to talk too much about, the, uh, about black history this month, but I am always doing, uh, I, I find books all the time, and I happen to notice I had an extra book of this on my shelf this week. It's Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery. It's really one of the, it's a classic narrative. Booker T. Washington uh, really was, was, not really, he was born into slavery. It's his story out of slavery. What I love about it is it's a very much a, a victor type of narrative. It's about a guy that had a lot of bad breaks, but he talks about how he came up out of those bad breaks and made a life for himself. If you don't know who Booker T. Washington is, he's a tremendous, he probably did more for African American progress in the early 20th century than anybody else. This is his autobiography. Is there anybody here that would like to have this? Would you? It's yours. Okay. Thank you. Bet. Just raise your hand. That's all it works. Um, also, uh, today is February 15th, and, um, you know, this is kind of a special day. What happened to my connection? Did we lose it? It says we're here. 
Did we not have it? Maybe it's not on the source. Did you guys ever see anything up there? No. I think just might, be, might be the source. I thought it was up there. I'm sorry. Technical difficulty here. I should always look at my screen before I go further. Is it not the source? So it should honestly you can find it. That must be what it's doing right now. Is this a MacBook? Yeah. Oh well, yeah, we had no here. Here, yeah, let's just escape out of it. All right, sing another song. <laughs> you got to have my. Oh, that's the turn. It should just be able to plug right in, though. If you're going to airplay it, that's not going to work with video. It doesn't do video well. We've got to plug it in to get the video to work. So I have, we've done a lot of videos with this keyboard. It might, might work. Do you want to test it quick? No, I don't, we don't have time for that. I'm already losing time, so I really want to. It's okay if we go. Let's see. Let's, let's, let's see. Let's say. You're up right now. Am I up right now? Oh, okay. All right. The only problem is, is I can't see my next slide now. Oh, are you doing the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to be able to see what my next slide is. Go up under, go up under view, or play. Sometimes play will tell you, give you those options. Play slideshow in window. No, that's just, or see it's mir what it's doing is mirroring. What we need to do, yeah, because it's mirroring, so we need to go to the uh, display. <laughs> Displays. Wow. Yeah, saying it's mirroring, it's mirroring. Just hit that one right there that says mirror. See if it'll come off of that. See mirror. Stop mirroring. It's going to use it as a monitor and then send it. But now we got to take it off of the. the we got to take it off of the playful screen. Oh my goodness. I still think we had to figure out why it's not plugging in. It should just read it right full from the plug-in. I'm going to get my, I'm going to get, maybe it might be your thing here. Did you find it? Oh, they must have got it. I'm gonna say try my try my brother plug here. Here, I can probably handle it from here. Let's just see. Well there should be something called presenter. Yeah. If you help. Let's just make sure we're we got our system set right. Sound is because when you unplug it, yesterday we lost the sound. Display. It's, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. It's on uh, upstairs, built. Yeah, it's, it's, it's playing now, the sound is now playing through the TV. So through TV. Okay, that's fine. All right. There we go. There we go. All right, we got it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> You know, there comes a moment for those of us who, um, who rely on technology where you just have to, get, you have to give it over to God.
many times that's what I've done. If you get in this situation, you just, as, a, as a teacher, as a presenter, you just you get, you take a deep breath and you say, God, I don't know what's going on, but you've got to fix this one. And it's amazing how, how many times it works that way. Okay, I wanted to share with you a little bit about today. I mean, I love to study history. So let's take a look at February 15th here and see what happened on this day in history. Uh, 399 B.C., that's when Socrates was sentenced to death by the city of Athens for corrupting the minds of the youth of the city. Wow. Yeah. On this date, in 1764, St. Louis, Missouri was founded. Yeah, that's pretty cool. In 1804, New Jersey became the last northern state to abolish slavery on this date. And in 1903, the teddy bear was introduced. Yeah. Wow. All right, but there's more. It's also the day that Meet the Beatles, the album, went number one and stayed at number one for 11 weeks in 1964, really cementing the Beatles in, in America. Uh, it's the first draft of the complete human genome published in the journal Nature. That was huge as far as genetics goes. And then YouTube was launched on this day in 2005. So happy YouTube day, all right? Yeah. There you go. Anybody born on this date? Do we got any February 15th birthdays in here? Probably not, all right? But here's the remarkable people that were born on this day. Galileo, Susan B. Anthony, Ernest Shackleton, he was a great explorer. Notable deaths, Nat King Cole died on this day. Ethel Merman, which you probably don't know who she is. The writer, P.J. O'Rourke. Yeah, great, great people, great day. Um, I, I want to share something with you to kind of get started. I mentioned that uh, yesterday I'm a cultural historian and kind of fell into this American history a, a bit during COVID and, uh, that's, and enjoying it. But as a cultural historian, I've been seeing a slow degradation, a degradation of American society really since the 1950s. And uh, back in the 80s, there was another guy that came along that kind of sparked my thinking on this. He talked about how each decade since 1950, there's been a general cultural loss. And I don't know where that guy went to in the 80s, but I just continue to add on to his frame uh, into, to today. So let me, let me show you what we've lost since the 1950s. Are you ready? Since 1950, okay? In the 50s, there was a general loss of innocence. That was when Playboy magazine came along. Suddenly, pornography was, was more mainstream, at least what they would call hip pornography. Uh, there was also the television came along in the 50s, and that really shifted how we viewed things. Uh, that, television changed everything as far as being able to see the world. We suddenly saw live news. Uh, that's really going to play a part during the Vietnam War. That was the first war that was actually witnessed and seen, and it really changed American sentiments towards the war. In the 1960s, there was a general loss of authority. All the institutions in the 1960s were attacked. Not just the church, but government, education, all those major institutions that really held us together as a country, as a nation, were attacked and undermined. In the 70s, there was a general loss of love. I grew up in the 70s as a 70s kid. You know, my parents split up. Uh, during, there was, divorce kind of really went on a, a rampage during the 70s. Uh, there was a, a complete loss of, uh, uh, and, there was, and kids, uh, we were known as, as um, uh, latchkey children in the 70s because they put little keys on our, our, our wrists or on our, in our pockets or on our pants so that when we got home at night, there were no parents. When we came home from school, there were no parents. So we would, uh, we would lock, unlock the, the door ourselves. Loss of love. In the 80s, there was a loss of hope. It was the Reagan Revolution, but the Reagan Revolution, as hopeful as it was, still couldn't deal with a lot of the underlying hopelessness that was starting to emerge. AIDS came up in the 1980s. Uh, other uh, social issues, drugs, uh, crack co cocaine in particular, became part of the story of the 1980s. There was a loss of, of hope. In the 1990s, and this is where I started to add on, these are all mine. In the 1990s, what I saw was a loss of respect. You know, kids back then, they, they call them the grunge kids. They started to wear their hats backward, and they started to wear holy jeans, and, and the, the hip-hop bunch would wear their jeans down to their knee balls. And, I mean, it was, it was really a different world, okay? And if you were growing up in that world and you were of an older generation, it was just like there, there was just no respect anymore. Profanity became more a part of our culture during the 90s. 
You know, a lot of the music really turned towards darker themes, more edgier themes. Nudity became a major play on cable television. There was just a general loss of respect. In the 2000s, okay, how many of you were born in the 2000s? That, okay, I'm going to say that's probably most of you in here, okay? The 2000s, loss of security. September 11, 2001, created a loss of security. Suddenly, uh, there, were, there was, you, you couldn't go to your school without mass shooting being a possibility. Your generation has been raised with more mass shootings than any other generation in history. You know, you've gone to school often with, with detectors there, you know, uh, metal detectors to let you in and security guards. And it's a different world for you than it was for, for me. You know what we lost in the last decade, though? We lost truth. That was the big thing I identified in the last, last decade. We've lost truth. We've lost a, a mooring for, for how we know something is true. But you know what we're losing right now? I, I, I thought about it. We're in 2003. But you know what I think we're losing in this decade? Identity. identity. You got it. I think we are losing our identity. We don't even know who we are anymore. Because once you lose truth, it's not too hard to lose who you are. Because who you are is often a, is directly related to how you view truth. So um, let me give you some more statistics before we get started with the American history component. This is from a 2022 Pew Research Center. And I'm just going to run through these, and then I want to hear your responses, okay? So here you go. 74% of U.S. adults say religion is losing its influence in American life. 74%. That's all United States adults, okay? So keep that in mind. Not just Christians think this. This is everybody. 60% of U.S. adults think the founders of America originally intended for the United States to be a Christian nation. That's kind of surprising when you think about it. If you think we've had, you know, 70 years of American history that's kind of taught the opposite, especially the last 30 years have taught the exact opposite, still more than half believe that we were originally intended for the, to be a Christian nation. Look, when you, when you parse this out to just Christian adults, 69% of Christian adults say America was founded as a Christian nation. 62% believe it still should be a Christian nation. But obviously, uh, we're post-Christian. Here's one that's very interesting to me from this study. 51% of U.S. adults think the Bible should have little or no influence on U.S. laws. Now, how many times have you heard somebody say to you, you cannot legislate your morality? You can't legislate your... Have you heard that one? Don't legislate your morality on my... I'm going, every law is a legislation of morality. A law against murder, for example, is a legislation of morality. You can't commit murder because it's not just against the law, it's because it's against, it's morally wrong. You can't perjure yourself in a court of law, tell something that's not true, because that would be morally wrong. Every law is rooted to a legislation of morality. So that's an angle. Whenever someone tells you that stuff, you say, wait a minute, every law is a legislation of morality. Pick one that isn't, okay? Now all you have to do is, the, the, the danger with this one that's interesting to me is, as you found out yesterday, and you would find out more if you really explore American history, is that we were built on law that literally emerged from the Ten Commandments and from the law of Jesus. The laws of Jesus. 51%, though, think that it should have little or no influence on U.S. law. 31% of uh, adults don't know or have no answer to the meaning what a Christian nation implies. So what do you do with that one? That's, that's interesting. 31% say, well, I don't even know what, what, what do you mean by Christian nation? What would that look like? You know what that tells me? Maybe there's hope. Okay? Maybe if we as Christians just start living as Christians, maybe there just might be hope. Okay? So, your takeaways, when you, when you consider these, what, what, what do you see? Any thoughts, concerns, questions? Yeah. Seems like uh, the American adults have lost hope. Right, yeah, they're, they're kind of reflecting what I've talked about there. Yeah, there was a, there's been a loss of hope. And by the way, those are continuing. You know, when we lost our innocence, it didn't just end in the 50s. That, that innocence has been lost all the way since. We've lost that forever. So we've lost love. We've lost hope. We've lost, you know, authority. You know, we've lost truth. When you don't have any authority, it's easy to lose truth at that point. Yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah.
Ah, I think that's a way, a way to look at it, for sure. It's a report card of the church, our influence. You know, uh, if you look at Europe today, so you go, to, go to Great Britain, go to, go to Germany, go to pl- parts of Europe, and look at what the church looks like there, what do you see? It's inactive, yeah, yeah. I was in Rome here, a Catholic, a Catholic area, right? You don't get more Catholic than Rome. And as I was right, running from the airport, uh, we, we had a, uh, like an, it was an Uber driver, somebody like, it wasn't Uber, but it was a driver taking us from, down to the air, from the airport down to the hotel. And I was asking the driver that night, I said, so how many, how many you're, you're Roman Catholic, how many Roman Catholics are actively practicing their faith? And he said, about 4%. 4% in Rome. And when you go around to the churches in Rome, you know what you see? You see a lot of empty cathedrals. And the only thing propping them up are tourists. Tourists who come in there and give money. So they don't even have money coming in from their people anymore. Their money comes from the tourists who go around, oh, that's a beautiful ceiling. I'm going to drop $20 in here just to say thank you. Do we want our churches? Of course, in America, most of our churches look like warehouses now. They don't even look like cathedrals. At least Roman, Rome cathedrals are something that are inspiring. It's hard to get inspired by many of our church buildings. Yes? We are more active. Right now, it depends on where you live. Uh, if you live in the deep south, it's about 35, 40% active attendance. And by active, we're talking about at least half the month. Two out of four Sundays, if you go to church, you're considered active in your Christianity. Isn't that sad? So you can miss half the time and still be active according to most of these statistics. You get into the northeast or the northwest where I'm from, it's, it's single digits. Less than 10% attend church twice a month. And of course, since COVID, the, the upper level, the ones who were really kind of holding up the church before COVID were this generation we call the boomer generation, born post-World War II, they were really the ones kind of keeping the church populated and the money flowing and such. They got used to watching church online, on the screen, and guess what they're doing? They're the largest generation not to come back post-COVID. They're not, they haven't returned at all, most of them. And so a lot of churches, at least on the mainland where I'm from, they, they're really struggling now. Or they're just gone. Yeah, well, some of them have folded, yeah. But a lot of them are still waiting for that new, that, that, that normal to be returned. And it's just, it's just not there. All right. Well, what I want to do is challenge you today. We want to come back to this idea. Uh, there's, and it's really not an idea. It's a statement of fact. America was founded by Christians. <laughs> you know, there were a few that were uh, what we would call deists, but they were Christian deists. They were influenced highly by their Christianity, uh, you know, Jefferson and and guys like that, you know, Benjamin Franklin, I don't think he was even a deist in the end. I think that's a complete mischaracterization of his life. He, does, he shows no evidence of deism towards the end of his life. Uh, he was faithful in going to his church. He was buried at his church. Churches just don't bury people that aren't regular members contributing Mary. They don't just put them in their cemeteries. That's why Thomas Paine couldn't find a cemetery. He wasn't a church member. But back then, if you went to church and you died at that church, you got to be part of the, the church cemetery. Ben Franklin's buried in a church cemetery. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for some. But um, anyway, what we're going to do now is we're going to take this next step and, and take a look more at uh, the founding foundations of our country. So hopefully this all works with sound. Let's check it out.
who gave us that document that today we so appreciate. And there were specific contributions made by many of them, and we just no longer talk about them. We don't talk about folks like Gouverneur Morris. Now, Gouverneur Morris, when's the last time you've heard that name? Every time we go into a courtroom to argue about a constitutional principle, we're arguing about exactly what he did. Gouverneur Morris was a signer from Pennsylvania. He was the final signer to sign the document. He was the most active member of the Constitutional Convention. He spoke on the floor of the convention 173 times. That's more than anybody else. Now, what makes him really remarkable is he is the penman of the Constitution. So we have these little kind of things hanging in our schools, constitutions. You just look in at the handiwork of Gouverneur Morris. He's a prolific writer. As a matter of fact, when France was doing their constitution, he said, we've already done our America. Let us show you how to do a constitution. And in doing that writing for the French constitution, he told them that, above all, they had to make sure that education was teaching religion and the duties of man toward God. He said, we already do that in America. You guys need to do that in France. <laughs> now, we don't hear that today. What we hear, oh, no, the constitution, you can't have any kind of religion in schools. Time out. The man who wrote the constitution, the penman of the constitution, says the school should be teaching religion. Schools should be teaching morality based on religion. And that's in his writing. But we know so little about the science of the Constitution, so how do we really know? We just base it because somebody else told us? That's the fortunate side of history, is we have prolific writers. These steps lead up to the visitor's gallery for the House of Representatives. Over the landing, you see a huge painting of the signing of the Constitution on September 17, 1787. This picture measures 20 feet by 30 feet. 55 founding fathers served at the convention which produced the Constitution, and 39 of them eventually signed that document. And like the painting of the signers of the Declaration, many of these faces and names are unfamiliar to us today. Let's rediscover something about many of those in this picture. Let's begin with Abraham Baldwin. Not only was he the chief founder of the University of Georgia, but in his time, he was considered to be one of America's youngest theologians. At the age of 21, he was offered a professorship of divinity at Yale University, and throughout the American Revolution, he served as a military chaplain. Abraham Baldwin, a signer of the Constitution, was not only a Christian, but he was a minister of the gospel. This man seated at the right of the table is Roger Sherman. He holds a unique position among the founding fathers in that he was the only founder to sign all four of America's founding documents. The Articles of Association in 1774, the Declaration of Independence in 1776, the Articles of Confederation in 1781, and the U.S. Constitution in 1787. Also, during the Constitutional Convention, Roger Sherman was instrumental in resolving the conflict over representation between the big states and the small states. Sherman's solution, now enshrined in the Constitution, was that Congress should be made up of two bodies, a Senate, where in each state, whether large or small, would have equal strength and an equal vote, good news for the small states, and a House, where in each state's strength would be determined by its population, good news for the big states. After the Constitution was ratified, Sherman became a member of the first Congress where he helped frame the Bill of Rights. However, in addition to being a leading statesman, Roger Sherman was also a theologian. In fact, a creed he personally wrote was adopted by his church. God did send his own son to become man, die in a room and instead of sinners, and thus to lay a foundation for the all. When you look at the Constitution and the Constitutional Convention and those who wrote it, we so often get the tone today that that was a secular document, those are secular guys, they, they didn't have any religious intent, right. which is really nonsense. When you look particularly after they came out of the Constitutional Convention, what they said about that document is really unbelievably religious. Uh, you have Benjamin Franklin, who 
who at the close of the convention says, I'm not saying that the Constitution is divinely inspired. Mm -hmm. He says, but I am saying that something of this momentous, this impact for so many million people could not have come into existence without being guided and directed by the omnipotent and all-powerful being in whom we live and move and have our being. So Franklin says, I'm not saying it's divinely inspired, but I am telling you this is an act of God. Wow. Then you get James Madison, that when he did the Federalist Papers to explain what they'd done in the Constitution, he said to the pious man, it's impossible not to recognize in this document a finger of that almighty providence who's extended to us throughout the course of the revolution. He said, and he concluded, he said, this document is a miracle. And that was the same term George Washington used. When he looked at the document at the end, he said, this, he, he said, you want my feelings? He wrote a letter. Someone asked him, what do you think about the Constitution? Because they want to know whether they support it. He says, you want to know my feelings? I'm very candid about this. This document is a miracle of heaven. Wow. He thought that God had done it. And then as it came time to ratify it, Dr. Benjamin Rush, who had signed the Declaration, who lived in Philadelphia and knew all these guys doing the Constitution, is talking to them day by day. Came time to finish the Constitution. It's now time to ratify it. And, and Benjamin Rush is an evangelical Christian. He says, I'm not saying the Constitution is divinely inspired. He said, but I am saying that the Constitution is as much of a miracle as any miracle performed in the Old or the New Testament. And the day we sit back and say, oh, no, it was a secular document. Why, they wouldn't want religious activities in public. And wow. that's just not in the records. So what do you think? What did you hear that was kind of like, whoa? Yes. Yeah. So many more. You, like it's, Governor Morris spoke more than any other of the framers of the, of the Constitutional Convention. He spoke about 173 times, he said. Yeah. What's his first name? Governor. Like governor, except it's governor, yeah. Very unique name, by the way. I've never been able to figure out, you know, why mommy and daddy named him that. But uh, obviously, nobody else after that named him. Named them, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was something. All right. What else did you learn from this little segment? The Dodger Sherman guy. Yeah. What about him? The only one. Yeah. Yeah. And I know these are kind of those little trivia facts, but I, again, in American history, a lot of times, I don't know if we're just kind of asleep in class. I know I was through a lot of American history class in high school, but these are interesting little things. Because you would think there were more men that would have signed all four of them, right? Well, I would. Right. Yeah, they are different, but it's the Declaration of Independence that really creates the Articles of Confederation, which eventually move into being the U.S. Constitution. Um, it's interesting, the Articles of Confederation, we never hear about the Articles of Confederation, but the Articles of Confederation were the loose confederation of the United States. And they, they did flop, yeah. It created all sorts of problems, including wars. <laughs> there were literal wars in the colonies that were going on uh, between colonists as a result of the Confederation Papers. Uh, so they came back and did the Constitution and tried to create a, a, a better frame. And when they got done with that, they still realized we've got a problem. Because if we're going to do this right, the U.S. Constitution's got to have some bill, what they call the Bill of Rights. We call them the Bill of Rights today, right? What are they? What's the First Amendment? Freedom of speech, freedom of the, the press, religion, yeah, the right to assembly, you know, First Amendment, Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, right? Not, not bear arms, but actually bear arms. Okay. okay, those are rights. They recognized very early that even the Constitution itself needed to be amended. Oh, now pause here just for a moment. How many of you have heard the line, especially in the last year, last June, the Supreme Court reversed Roe v. Wade and now made abortion illegal in America? Is that what you heard? It's what I heard, right? Abortion is now illegal. No. Actually, Roe v. Wade was a bad decision itself. Roe v. Wade was, was done. The, the court at that time was a more of an activist court coming out of the 60s. 
A lot of the judges that were on the Supreme Court of the United States in 1973 were appointed by uh, Kennedy and Johnson, and they were, they were individuals that were on the left side. Some of the, some of the most liberal justices we ever had were on that particular court. And so on the subject of abortion, they were open to it. But here's what was going on with abortion. Before 1973, it was a state issue. States had the right to determine whether or not abortion was legal or illegal. Kind of the same thing they did with suicide. Do you realize a lot of states have on their books a law that says you can't commit suicide? Now, we don't, we don't actually, we don't, well, we don't. But there are still states out there where suicide is illegal. How do you enforce it? It's right. How do you enforce that one? But it's illegal. The whole idea was this, is if abortion is truly murder, and murder is morally wrong, and we, we, we convict for murder, how should we respond to abortion? Right? So fundamentally, if you believe abortion is a murder of a human being, then you have to, by law, deal with that. And before 1973, it was all about the states. Each state was allowed to deal with it. And what happened was Texas, uh, well, to give a little uh, example here beforehand, what a lot of states started to do, California, New York, but particularly California, they were the first, they legalized abortion in California back in 1967, 1968. It was pre-70. And because of that, a lot of women, when they got pregnant, who wanted an abortion, they would get on a plane. They actually had a, a plane dedicated to Pineapple Express that would fly them to California for abortions. Okay? Well, what happened was Texas started to have this argument going on, and this Roe v. Wade was a situation in Texas. It was a court case in Texas where a woman basically wanted an abortion, and Texas says, no, it's illegal, and she took it all the way to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said abortion should be legal. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Constitutionally, the Supreme Court does not legalize anything. It doesn't even make things illegal. Did you know that? It doesn't. All the Supreme Court does, according to our Constitution, is offer an opinion on the law. We, the people, decide whether or not something needs to be legal or illegal or whatever. Now, we do that, hopefully, through our, our representatives that go to Washington, D.C., and they create laws. That's what representatives are supposed to do, not to hold trials and different things like that. Their real job is to go there and legislate. They're legislators. They create laws. When they create a law that basically has issues, the Supreme Court, as it runs up through the different courts, the Supreme Court can then offer an opinion on that. And at that point, usually, it's strong enough where the states then come back and say, hey, we're not, we don't have to obey this. The Supreme Court has said we don't have to obey this. So we're not going to obey it. That's what creates the problems. In the U.S. Constitution, I find it interesting to me that most of the, when we think of the, what are the three branches of government, by the way? Legislative, legislative, legislative executive, and judicial. Legislative, executive, and judicial. Now, co-equal, right? Co-equal, meaning they're all the same power? That's what we're taught. That's what we're taught, right? It's not true. It's not true. Read your U.S. Constitution. Most of us have never even read the U.S. Constitution, including me. It wasn't until two years ago I actually opened up and read the entire U.S. Constitution. Okay? The U.S. Constitution spends most of its time, most of its energies, on the legislative branch, talking about how we the people create this legislative branch and how they need to operate as legislators. The next most powerful one is the executive branch, the U.S. president. The president presides. He is the person that represents the people. The people have elected him, okay? He's the one that presides over it. And the vice president actually sits over the Senate. The one that got the least amount of attention, in fact, it's very little attention, is the, the judicial branch. The judicial branch. And that's because it was the weakest. Did you know the Supreme Court didn't even have a, a place to, to live, so to speak? I mean, now when we think of the Supreme Court, you think of that building in Washington, D.C. You think of the Supreme Court house. You know who built that? FDR, Roosevelt, 
in the 1930s, I think it was 1933, was when the Supreme Court house was built for the Supreme Court. You know where the Supreme Court held business up until 1933? In the old Senate chambers in the U.S. Capitol. See, we never hear these things because we've lost, we don't even get taught civics anymore, do we? See, when I was a kid, I got at least a class on civics where I learned all this stuff, didn't pay attention, but I'd learned it. But now we, we have this idea they're all co-equal, and, and if, the, if the Supreme Court says something's illegal, then that's the final arbiter. I say baloney. Do you realize Lincoln did not obey the Supreme Court? In 1857, the U.S. Supreme Court basically declared in the Dred Scott decision that a black person was not even a human being. It was just property. That's why it's called the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott was a slave, and he was trying to be viewed as a human being. He was property, and it was, again, a SCOTUS that was running rogue, created this decision. Lincoln comes along as the president of the United States and says, I am not going to obey that decision. And the reason was was because he had a rightful view of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court was an opinion, an opinion on the law. He's not the first to do it. Andrew Jackson. Go back, go back 20 years earlier in the 1820s, 18, early 1830s, but I think it was 1828 to be exact. Andrew Jackson came out and said, I am not going to listen to the Supreme Court on this decision. You see, his administration had made a decision to move all the eastern Indians to reservations in Oklahoma. It's called the Trail of Tears. And it created a huge uproar. Do you know why he wanted to move them? Any idea why he wanted to move all the Indians out of the south into Oklahoma? He wanted the land. He wanted the land for them to farm to create more cotton. And also, the other thing is, it created more human beings down there in the south. Got to make sure I got the right one. Is this right? Yeah, this works. More human beings down in the south so that they could have more legislative power. How many of you heard this thing about the black person in America, that they're only worth three-fifths of a man. You heard that? It's true. U.S. Constitution states that. This is the problem, though, in early America. But why did they call them three-fifths? Is it because a, a black person is a, no, only three-fifths? They well, they couldn't vote already. No, but they couldn't have any power. Right. Well, here's the, this is so wonderful. I'm going to keep that up there. Back then, in that day and age, in America, every state, okay, let's say it's America, every state had its two senators, right? Everybody got their two senators, and then the size of the state, they got a certain number of representatives, okay? So if they had, you know, it might be anywhere from 5 to 7 to 13 to you know, 10, let's just kind of maybe three here, small state, okay? Here's the problem. When it came to the South, the South wanted to suddenly count all their slaves as human beings in order to get representative, representation in the Congress. And the Northern, the northern, went, northern representatives said, what? what? You can't do that. You, co you consider them property. You, can't consider, you don't consider them human beings. Now, if they were considered human beings, what should we do with them? Free them. We need to free them. If they're really human beings, let's free them. If you want to make them 100% human beings, then they should be freed. The southern, the southern states were unwilling to do that. Where was Andrew Jackson from? Tennessee, a southern state, right? So this whole three-fifths rule came about because it was compromised. Basically, the northern states realized, you know, if we let them have 100%, let's say they, they gave them 100%, so they were five-fifths, one, one whole, they counted every black person, that meant that the southern states would have maybe now 20 instead of 10. They'd have a lot more because there were a lot of blacks in the south. Make sense? So what they did was they settled it with three-fifths. It actually, for my black friends, I always share with them, the three-fifths rule actually was to your benefit when you think about it. Because technically, there should have been no fifths. They could have come back and said, if you're not going to count the southern blacks, we're not going to count blacks whatsoever. But the northern, the northern colony said, no, we believe the blacks are 100% human. We want them to vote. In fact, free blacks could vote at that time in the north. So that's where the three-fifths rule comes along. 
Andrew Jackson in, the 19, in 1928 decides to move out all the Indians to Oklahoma. And it creates quite an uproar. Quite an uproar. The Trail of Tears is the ensuing thing. In that moment, the Supreme Court, it went all the way. They, the law went all the way up to the Supreme Court because it really wasn't a law. It's, it's really how Barack Obama was the first president to really put this into motion. Barack Obama ruled by executive order. Have you heard that? That's where the president says, I'm not going to go through Congress. I'm not going to go through the legislature to create a law. I'm just going to order things. They're executive orders. You know how much power an executive order has? Zip. It's just one man talking from the presidency. They have no, they have no teeth. Unless the people want to say, yeah, we believe in that executive order. We want to do it. That makes sense? What do you think Donald Trump did on his first day in office? All Donald Trump did on the first day of office was he took all of Barack Obama's executive orders and reversed them. What do you think Joe Biden did to all of Trump's executive orders that he reversed? Yeah. Right. So here's the thing. This is what I want to get to as we close today. We the people, oh, on the SCOTUS decision, Andrew Jackson was told by the United States Supreme Court at that time that it was illegal to move those Indians to Oklahoma. He, they told him, our opinion is they can stay put. And Andrew Jackson just said, forget you. I'm going to move them. And his administration moved them. That's the Trail of Tears. So here's what, here's what constitutionally we have. I'll end on this and we'll take a break. Constitutionally, we the people, right? You know how they changed the Constitution up until really the 1960s? They were called amendments. Amendments to the Constitution. Every one of the big decisions. You realize in the early 1920s there was a constitutional amendment to outlaw alcohol. We called it prohibition. Heard that? They actually outlawed, and who decided that? It went, it was, a, it was decided we're going to have an amendment to the Constitution that's going to say no more alcohol in America. We're going to be totally dry. And we, the people, voted it in. And literally, we broke the alcohol. You know, we, we had no, for what, almost 10 years, there was no alcohol in America. Not, not true, right? <laughs> if, you, if, you're, if you know the story of Prohibition, it wasn't true. There was the underground going on. Okay? The black market was still running. So you still had the speakeasies. That's why, you know why they call them speakeasies? Because they had to have a, they had to be quiet, you know. But you, the interesting part is most of the speakeasies I'm, I've been aware of. There's one in Pendleton, Oregon, that I, I take my guests to look at there, and those speakeasies, they they had they had the police bought off. The police actually were in on the gig, so not a big deal. But here's what's interesting about prohibition: who changed it back? We the people did, right? Ten years later. We, the people, said we need another amendment to the Constitution. We need to change the Constitution back to where alcohol is now allowed. And they repealed the previous amendment. Let me suggest to you that's how we answer the abortion question in America today. What we need today in America is for we, the people, to present a life amendment. I call it a life amendment, which basically would say to, to America, we're either going to be a, a, a culture of life or we're going to be a culture of death. And by that, it means that we are going to honor life from conception to the very end, which means we're no longer going to abort. We believe abortion is murder. Therefore, it should be illegal, just like slavery was. Slavery was the same way. Make it illegal. To the other end, where uh, euthanasia. There are people out there that when they get too old want to kill themselves or have somebody else kill them. Assisted suicide, it's called. That also is illegal in most states now. What if we had a life amendment that basically brought it to the people? Now, if Americans decide that they, don't, they reject that, it would be like what happened with the Women's Lib Amendment in the uh, 1970s. It never got, you have to have two-thirds of the states to, to agree in order for it to be passed. If two-thirds of the states don't agree, you know there are amendments right now on the books out there that have never gotten passed. They've never been passed because they can't get two-thirds of the states to agree. That's how we change the laws of the land. When our legislators won't do it, it's not about the Supreme Court. Do you hear me? That's the weakest of the branches. That's Constitution. All right, a little civics lesson for you there. It's time for a break. We'll see you back in 15.
You guys rock. Oh, you rock. You rock. Oh, you, oh, you rock. So is that like Yeah. Is that like petitioning or like what is what does that even look like? Pet- petitioning? Right. Well, the only way to do it is to create an amendment. Um, the, and that, you know where that comes from? I, I think there are other amendments we need, too. For example, I think we need an amendment on term limits. You know, but I'm uh, just saying, like, yeah. how do you even start something? Like you know, it starts through the legislation. The legislators have to, uh, you know, in Congress, they have to say, we want this to go as an amendment to the Constitution. The Senate and the House have to say this is going to be an amendment to the Constitution, and then they put it out to the states, and each one of the states then have to vote on it within a certain amount of years. You know. How do the people get something to the House and the Senate? We have to do it through our legislators. It's our own legislators. It can happen in my state. Yeah, what, where are you from? California. Yeah, well, no, it won't be. But see, it doesn't have to be. Two-thirds of the states. This is what makes it interesting. So if it... Two-thirds of the states or two-thirds of the population? Two-thirds of the states. That's where it gets different. And when you start adding up pro-life states in America, it's well over half already are pro-life. Well over half. In fact, if you look at it, it's almost like the same thing.